Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for being here this evening for our Oblong Online book launch event for Together in a Sudden Strangeness, America's Poets Respond to the Pandemic, which was actually released today. So a big congratulations to Alice and to all of the contributing poets. Before we officially begin, I just want to say a few quick notes of housekeeping. First off, if you have a question at any point during the event, you will notice that there is a question box down at the bottom of your screen, where you, toward, a little bit towards the right, where you can enter a question. And during the last part of the event, during the audience Q&A, we will go through your questions and answer them, whether they be for Alice or to one of our other fantastic speakers for this evening. You'll also notice that down there by the ask a question button, there's also a buy the book button, is a big green button. So if you're interested, you can get signed copies of Together in a Sudden Strangeness and also titles by all of the featured poets that are speaking with us this evening. They're all available at oblongbooks.com and your purchase goes to support our indie bookstore in the midst of this pandemic and what would have been our holiday season. So thank you so much in advance if you are able to participate in that. So now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's host and editor of Together in a Sudden Strangeness, Alice Quinn, and tonight's poets and readers. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about Together in a Sudden Strangeness, which came about as COVID-19 was beginning to spread around the United States and the world when Alice Quinn reached out to poets across the country to see if and what they were writing about during quarantine. Overwhelmed by the response, the one-time New Yorker poetry editor and recent former director of the Poetry Society of America began collecting the compassionate verses that were arriving in her inbox, assembling this various intimate and intricate portrait of our suddenly altered reality. Alice currently teaches at Columbia University School of the Arts and is the editor of a book of Elizabeth Bishop's writings, Edgar Allan Poe and the Jukebox, Uncollected Poems, Drafts and Fragments, as well as the forthcoming book of Bishop's Journals. Also joining us this evening are six of the book's contributors, Susan King Solving, whose poems have been described by the New Yorker as grand and almost terrifying. Her fourth collection, Peripheral Vision, was published by Red Hen Press. She is poet in residence at Hotchkiss School. Billy Collins, who is the former poet laureate of the United States from 2001 to 2003. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the author of many collections, including The Rain in Portugal, and most recently, Whale Day, which was published in September, 2020. B.J. Sashadri, whose latest poetry book is That Was Now, This Is Then, which was published by Grey Wolf Press this year. Camila Aisha Moon is the author of Starshine and Clay, and she has a name. She teaches creative writing at Agnes Scott College and has been published widely. April Bernard, who writes poetry, fiction, and essays, and her most recent books are Miss Fuller, a novel, and Brawl and Jag, a collection of poems, and Tomas Q. Marin, who is the author of Patient Zero and A Larger Country. Welcome, Alice. I will now pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Leif. I, I, I just want to say a few words of gratitude. Um, I want to thank Leif Cantrell and Helen Seslowski of Oblong Books up here uh, in this neck of the woods, Millerton, New York, which is a converging spot between Northwest, the northwest corner of Connecticut the southeastern corner of New York and the southwestern corner of Massachusetts, sometimes called the 14th colony. And it's very, very beautiful up here. And I'm so grateful to you for hosting this event. I, I wanna say a word about the literary agent, David Kuhn, who actually approached me to put this book together. He was my colleague in the 1990s in the Tina Brown years at The New Yorker and his literary agency is actually called Avitas, A-E-V-I-T-A-S. And I bring that up because what that word means is the time through which a person is living or a thing lasts. Now, what could be more perfect for this anthology? What more perfect marriage of a naming concept and a particular project than, than that? Um, the Delights of Nomenclature. I want to thank my editor, Deborah Garrison, whose help and support knows no bounds, and whose terrific poem, Leaving Evanston, provides a miraculous and resonant snapshot of this time for college students and college graduates. 
Uh, I just want to say a few words about how the book came together. David approached me and I decided I, I thought I could do this. And I wrote to the 125 poets whose addresses I had ready to hand up here in Millerton. I asked all the 125 people I addressed to recommend other poets to me and to have them be in touch with me and to share their email addresses so that I could reach out to them. And within a very few weeks, I was corresponding with hundreds of poets. And in 40 days, basically from March 26th, when I first reached out to June 6th, which was the day we closed the door on the ebook, uh, 40 biblical days, we had 87 poems. Um, and then the second phase of the pandemic, the, the Black Lives Matter aspect of this pandemic time, um, that so significant call to arms that we've all felt, um, needed to be incorporated. It's part of this time in a big way. So from June to mid-July, we reached out and uh, were able to capture brilliant poems by Sally Wen Mao, uh, a poem called Batchet, and a beautiful poem by Jericho Brown and Claudia Rankine. Both those poems ran in the Times Magazine section. And so these new 21 poems are a part of the hardcover, which is published today. Uh, there are aspects of this book that I'm proud of and that make me so happy. One is the A to Z aspect that uh, the poem, um, the book begins with Yulia Arvarez's poem, How Will This Pandemic Affect Poetry? Which includes these lines. Will the lines be six feet apart? Uh, will each word have to be masked? Will there be poetry in security? Will there be enough poetry to go around? What if only poetry will see us through? What if this poem is the vaccine already working inside you? And the Z of that, Matthew Zapruder, his uh, beautiful poem, has uh, closes with the lines, I love my son, his little bear pajamas, my wife, the grass, the ends of poems. So from will the lines be six feet apart to I love the end, the ends of poems. That was just very fortuitous and marvelous. There are poems by two doctors. There are poems by poets who were ill and who have had dear ones die. There are poems of scenes with parents and children. Beautiful poem by Garrett Hongo. Uh, and we'll hear Tomas Q. Marin's Vallejo. Beautiful poem to, about his children. There are prose poems. There are jaunty poems and gravely beautiful poems. Um, so the range is really marvelous, and I hope it will be reflected in tonight's event, and, and they will enjoy it very much. Um, we're going to begin with Susan Consolving, and Susan has a, a wonderful villanelle in the book, and she actually wrote a subsequent villanelle. Um, so, Susan, why don't you take off and launch the evening? Hi, Alice. Yeah, yep. perfect. All right. I didn't, yeah, I didn't hear you, but here I am. Great. You'd ask for me, correct? You'll, you'll read My Heart Cannot Accept It All and then the second Villanelle. And you might say a word about the Villanelle form. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, first of all, thank you, Alice. And certainly uh, one of the joys of living in the northwest corner of Connecticut is having right near us in Dutchess County a great independent bookstore. So. Thank you, Oblong. Uh, you keep us all happy in many ways. Uh, the Villanelle. When Alice invited me uh, to participate in the anthology, I thought of COVID-19, of course, and I thought of the one form of a 19-line poem, which is the Villanelle. 
Uh, it consists of two rhyme schemes that go interlacing through uh, six stanzas. And I thought, well, the obvious, 1919, I will try the, uh, the Villanelle. So, um, and two came about. Um, this is the first one. Forgive yourself for thinking small, for cooking soup, ignoring blight. The mind cannot contain it all, despite intent and wherewithal. It's little stuff that brings delight. A book, a drink, keep thinking small. A bubble bath, an odd phone call, resisting all those gigabytes. Your mind will not embrace it all. Quarantine its one long haul. As days grow long, so do nights. Forgive yourself for thinking small. Popcorn, TV, more alcohol. There's no need to be contrite. My mind cannot believe it all, this vast and shocking viral sprawl infections with no end in sight. Forgive me, please. I'm thinking small. My heart cannot accept it all. So uh, that was one 19 line poem. And um, here is a second one. Uh, it is entitled Measuring Number 19. How do you measure so much pain when there's no way to quantify? Since you're alive, don't dare complain. So what? You're feeling mental strain? Your quarantine now stultifies? You can't relate to so much pain? Your distancing may be in vain? You want to laugh but start to cry? If you're alive, don't dare complain. The toughest work is most humane, for which you may not qualify. How do you measure so much pain? While numbers shock, worse is a name, an obit you identify. But you're alive and won't complain. You'll keep busy and acting sane as ghostly time keeps flying by. How do you measure so much pain? If life is good, don't dare complain. So those are my two 19 line poems for COVID-19. And I must say, I'm very proud to be in this anthology. It's a terrific collection and a great book for the holidays. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you read that second poem. And I'm thrilled that Billy Collins is going to read two short new ones after he reads the poem in the book called Sequestration, which was one of the earliest that we had for this book. So welcome, Billy, and thanks a lot. We're ready, Billy. Oh, okay. We're, did you introduce me? I did. I cut out there for a minute. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm also very happy to be in the anthology. And I'm amazed at how you <clears throat> marshaled the troops here. And you mentioned June 6th as your date. And that was the invasion of, of Europe. Um, so you've done a really good job getting all these people together, these troops together. Um, so I don't know what you said in the introduction. Did you say I was going to read it? Well, I didn't poem? say that you were joining us from Winter Park, Florida, but you right. are. And I did say that I've asked you to read uh, two, two short poems that you've written right. since this poem. Okay, great. I'm very glad to do all that. So the poem um, in the anthology is called Sequestration. <clears throat> no one's going anywhere, and they say it's like this all over the rooftops and quarters of the world. 
Whenever a doorbell buzzes, a man and a woman freeze in place. No one wants to touch the package left on the welcome mat. Sometimes she'll get up from reading everyone's horoscope to have a look in the pantry, or he will draw back a curtain and see a man below on the street vanishing around a corner. Mostly, there is nothing to do. They sit in separate rooms, guarding their own lives. Two pilot lights flickering where their hearts used to beat. And I guess I was taken by the separation of uh, people uh, being locked down and quarantining and, and uh, uh, being imprisoned by this thing. And then um, two little poems came out of this um, later, uh, one's just six lines long. And it was a takeoff on two of my favorite lines in poetry. And that's when in the Ode to the West Wind, Shelley um, uses the term, um, he's describing blowing leaves. This is in the poem actually, but he describes them as pestilence stricken multitudes, as if these leaves are fleeing a plague. And it's called com uh, comparisons. In Ode to the West Wind, Shelley calls a scattering of blown leaves, pestilence stricken multitudes. And now we are the stricken with no place to scatter. And this year's leaves have begun to fall. And the other one is just eight lines long. And it came from watching a nurse being, um, an exhausted nurse being interviewed uh, on, on the television. And it's simply called Nurse. The one who spoke by a window in a stairwell, resting her head on her arm, said she was so many stumbles beyond tired. She caught herself envying the dead for looking like sleepers in their beds. You know, Billy, that is so precisely what Nicole Cooley's poem ends with, the image of her mother looking like a sleeping being when mm -hmm. her father discovers her mother dead. It's right. so powerful. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Well, Thank I'm you. very, very proud and honored to be part of this uh, collection. Thank you, Billy. So uh, Kamala Aisha Moon is going to read her poem, Storm. And say a few words about it afterwards, I hope. Apologies, Alice. We're just waiting for it to load. Okay, great. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Um, like everyone else, just, just an honor um, to answer the call and be included this evening. Um, you know, um, COVID, the pandemic, is, is not just statistics. I, it's never been something I've been able to keep at arm's length. It's, it's, it's been with me every second of this year for various reasons. Um, and I'm gonna read my poem first. It's called Storm. And I would like to dedicate this poem to my mother, Carolyn, and to my friend, Beverly Powell, who um, sadly passed yesterday um, from this illness. So, Storm. Night squall raging, black branches batter every window as the sky lashes the city. Without devices, all I can do is shelter in place and wait the latest nightmare out. Find other sources of power as I sit in the dark, save for a candle burning for my mother, writhing in an ICU, and for the world to make it against all odds. In every sense, I burn in the unseen places, head filling with smoke, each hour lived in a dense haze. Millions weather this 21st century unholy Passover, homes bereft and sin forever. The unruly rich in charge elect themselves gods, maniacal and merciless. Every warning unheeded, 
No bona fide mark of protection this time. No choice and the loss is reigning almost everywhere. Candlelight for two is a date. I remember those. Candlelight alone is a seance. Forgive me, my dearly departed, for crying out so often, for still needing you so damn much. Kamala, I think the end of that poem essentializes the cri de cur that is behind so many of these poems. Thank yeah, you. you know, um, Alice, I'm generally of the school that poems benefit from time and emotional distance um, from the experiences that birth them. You know, I think perspective is an excellent teacher. You know, time's a really good editor. <laughs> um, but, you know, writing from inside the cauldron, um, as you're moving through it real time, it just lends an urgency and a visceral nature um, to what's happened, you know? Um, I think, um, I think, the poems in this collection do an excellent job of that. And so um, because we're writing from that place, it's happening for them the way it happened to us, you know? Um, you know, poetry has always been a lifeline, but I think in 2020, um, having lost my mother um, and, and losing friends left and right, um, it tethers me to the present, it tethers me to myself, to others, to possibility, and I guess most importantly, hope. Yeah. Hope that we'll, we'll see each other through this somehow. So thanks again for gathering us. Thank you, Camila, so, so much. Mm -hmm. DJ, are you, are you here from Brooklyn? To read your poem, April 5th, 2020. Everyone, I think it'll take just a moment. Uh, while we're waiting, I think I'll tell everybody that we've dedicated this book to the memory of Ivan Boland, the wonderful Irish poet who died April 27th, 2020. And uh, I think I'll read the excerpt from her poem that we have on the dedication page. A woman leans down to catch a child who has run into her arms this moment. Stars rise, moths flutter, apples sweeten in the dark. Ivan was such an incredible presence in, in Ireland, drawing, so, drawing attention to so many phenomenal poets and women poets too. Welcome, VJ. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I think I needed to remind everybody that we we should be in Chrome. Yeah, I uh, I was in Chrome, and but I was uh, I couldn't uh, get to you, Alice. <laughs> oh gosh. I was reaching out towards you, but I couldn't arrive. It was like a dream. <laughs> yeah, where you're running and running and you never get there. It was that kind of thing, and uh, but I made it. You made it, thanks. Are you gonna read Evan's poem before I read? Should I? Uh... I did already. Oh, you I did? A little bit of it. Okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for this anthology and for the work you put into it, the labor of love and, you know, and, uh, and thank you for including me. It's a great book and uh, it's going to be documentary, but it's also going to be kind of permanent because this is such an important event. And uh, I'm going to read my poem from it. Uh, can you all see me still? Or? Yes. OK, good. Yeah. It's like one of those kid things, right? When you're a little child and you cover your eyes and you think nobody sees you. It's the Zoom experience. This poem was written on April 5th, 2020, here in Brooklyn, where the streets were empty and the only sound was the sound of the sirens wailing. And, uh, and looking back on it, I feel like, wow, 
we've come so far from that moment, but still seem to be trapped in this world. And, uh, and at that time, I think New York was having about 22,000 new cases a day and about 800 to 1,000 deaths. And the poem sort of reflects that, the consciousness of that moment for us New Yorkers. And it's called April 5th, 2020. Plague thoughts enter the next phase. I just don't want to talk about it. Okay, okay, let's not. Not the stories, the unbearable stories. You have five, you don't want any more. You have 15, how did you get so many? Because you live here. Because you identify here. Why do you live here? Why do you live anywhere? Identify anywhere. Because of all these, these the people, these the mysterious people, the people. Run, run, says the plague. Some run out, some run in, some can't run. All are comprehended by the plague. Such a beautiful comprehender, such a beautiful talker. Eloquent, intelligent, lucid, precise, analytical. Graphs, charts, little and big dots across the world. Such a teacher. About ourselves, we are learning so much from you. Thank you, Vijay. That the why of your poem has such an authentic power like the why in elizabeth bishops in the waiting room why should you be one too mm -hmm. you know really wonderful thank you very very much mm -hmm. thank you so april uh is in saratoga springs and is going to read her poem called haunt Maybe I, are you ready, April? Hi there. Good. I was asked to join. I joined. Here I am. <laughs> That's good. Shall I just get going? Yeah. Okay. Um, the poem that I have, it's funny. I, I love this collection so much, and I've been reading it, and, and feeling um, less alone, which is a good thing to feel less alone. And... It occurred to me that the poem that I've contributed is, uh, it's not really about the pandemic, but it, it is set in the pandemic. But what has happened to me, and I'm sure to many people, is that certain kinds of personal trouble gets kind of exaggerated and compressed because of the experience, it's certainly in the first uh, couple of months of the lockdown. And uh, I think if I were setting out deliberately to write about the experience of the pandemic, I might be, I might have wanted to reach out more to the suffering of others, but I was very uh, thrown back on myself and as you will see a personal situation that led to this poem being written. It's called Haunt. Six months after death, my mother has come to haunt me. Ever the opportunist, she finds the virus lockdown a handy time to slide into the slot for my shadow as if I faced the sun at an angle of 45 degrees. There she is, darkening my starboard periphery, unsmiling, reaching cold mist hands into mine to whisk the eggs, fold the sheets, sort the papers, choose spool of thread for stitching another face mask. This is her kind of catastrophe, rife with irony and fear and small domestic refinements of infinite unimportance as we sail about the house and yard, posing for no one. 
I once thought ghosts made appearances, but she eludes sight, dodgy, palpable, squeezing in for one last clutch at the stuff of my survival. Oh, I was so taken with that poem when I saw it in the New York Review of Books, April. Thank, thank, you. You, thank you for letting us have it for the book. You're very welcome. Okay. It's wonderful to be in this collection and I'm very honored. Thank you. Thank you. So we are going to conclude with Tomas Q. Marin's poem, Vallejo, uh, which is just so jaunty and special and moving. Uh, involving his children in a very, very touching way. So I wonder if it'll take us a few minutes to get him on the screen. Maybe I'll describe the Oblong because of Oblong Books, which is a 60 mile stretch from Pauling to Ancrum, New York, two miles wide, which was swapped in the early 1800s for Fairfield County in Connecticut. And uh, so we have the rural side of it and Connecticut has all that money from the taxes of Fairfield County and uh, the Oblong uh, is very significant up in Dutchess County. And I also could talk about the title of the book, uh, in Pablo Neruda's Keeping Quiet, the poem from which the title of this book is drawn, and which now links us back to the first phase of the pandemic, um, he wrote, for once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Perhaps the earth can teach us, he writes toward the close of that poem in Alastair Reed's translation, quote, as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. So welcome, Tomas. Hi, Alice. How are you? Good. It's good to see everyone. Um, thank you, Oblong, for hosting us and Alice for bringing us um, all together. Um, and for uh, inviting me to be in uh, the company of Kamala Aisha, uh, April, Vijay, Susan, Billy, just such wonderful work and such a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, so when I, I heard that there was a there was a call uh, that Alice had sent the call out for uh, for poems for this anthology, um, like I'd had no plans to write anything, you know, about about. Uh, COVID-19 or the pandemic. Um, but I felt like I needed to write something. And I'd had this idea for a poem for quite a while, um, uh, something having to do with my sneezes, uh, because my partner says this funny thing every time I sneeze, I have very loud sneezes. She always says that it sounds like I'm saying Vallejo. Um, so I knew that that was going to be a poem uh, that had to do with something. And then COVID happened and I thought, well, maybe this is the poem. Vallejo. You can't just sneeze anywhere anymore. I was pushing you in the stroller when the sidewalk ended like a roll of floss. I crossed the street and the old woman walking her Jack Russell said, oh, you didn't need to cross. If she'd heard one of my monstrous sneezes followed by your mama saying, Vallejo, would she have thought it also sounded like I was saying the name of the poet? I swear he looks like a young Abraham Lincoln in the sketches of Picasso. I need some human poems today. Human poem sounds odd, unlike the poemas humanos of Cesar Vallejo. That's a title people can get behind. I asked the English language if we could do any better. It shrugged its shoulders and said, People poems, mankind poems. There are too many dogs in this neighborhood. Where are all the cats? A day with a cat is a masterclass in keeping your distance from even the ones you love. My cat was 19 years, 10 months and three days old when she died. At least that's the story I tell 
since really all I ever knew was the birth date of her two kittens. She'd be aces at all this stay home, wash your hands often business. I wish she was still here so I could show her the video of the swans and the dolphins swimming in the canals of Venice. Sure, a smarty already proved they were fake. I guess for some people only real hope has value during an apocalypse. I keep thinking about the old woman and her dog. I hope she's okay and doesn't think I was afraid of her. Can you imagine that? All it took was a pandemic to turn the world into a pineapple upside down cake. The virus kind of looks like one, to be honest. Just a block later, I pulled a rose petal and let you smell it. I smelled it first to show you how. I know you smiled, but maybe it was because I looked so happy, breathing that pink petal in so deep. When you opened your mouth, I said, no, no, no. But I hear some fancy humans do eat roses. I love you, but can you take your sister and please slip away from gravity in the flying saucer of your Baba black sheep? I don't want you to see the planet this sad. Tell him to fly around the earth as fast as Superman did in 1978. Your mama was the age you are now when that happened. Looking back, that time doesn't seem so bad anymore. Tell him to fly counterclockwise because the future waits in that direction. You'll like it there. It's safe enough that a dish can still run away with a spoon. Ah, oh, thank you so much from Abraham Lincoln to Picasso to cats to the cow jumped over the moon. It's just so nimble. It's really, and everyone, thank you very much. Those were terrific, really great. I think they captured the range of the book so much. And I think that there are some questions in the chat room. And Leif, are you going to be the maestro of that? Wow. That was so fantastic. Thank you to all of our poets and thank you, Alice. That was, you gave so much to us this evening and just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, we don't actually have any questions yet. Um, folks have been using the ask a question to interact a lot with each other, which is so sweet. Um, but to all of our audience members out there, if you have any questions for Alice or any of our poets who spoke this evening, I'd encourage you to ask them now. And I was thinking, Alice, maybe while folks are processing yeah. these beautiful words they've just heard um, and these sentiments, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the process of gathering together. I know you talked about it during your introduction, but maybe you could elaborate. Well, I think what's so wonderful is the way the poems speak to each other, kind of in a in a cat's cradle. Mm. Uh, and there are some, there's, there's a really, the book opens, with the Alvarez poem I mentioned, but there's some fabulous prose poems by Rick Barrett. And one of the great um, aspects of this journey for me is the way poets recommended poems by other mm -hmm. poets. And for instance, Sandra Cisneros didn't have a poem, but she sent me five or six names of poets she admired. And we have a fabulous poem by Tammy Melody Gomez in the book. And uh, Dana Levin, the poet, recommended Rick Barrett. And I'd just like to read uh, two of his very short prose poems from a sequence of about 41 of them, which were published in a, a special press edition of 162 copies, and it sold out in three hours. So this is Rick Barrett from During the Pandemic. During the pandemic, I knew each neighbor by one thing. The neighbors above, the baby. The neighbors below, the dog. Someone down the hall, fried fish. Someone else down the hall, the opera when their door opened. I made my rooms quieter by standing in the middle of each one, my mind moving intently like an old man in slippers. I wondered what one thing the neighbors would know me by. What truth and inadvertence could betray? Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. 
I think I'll, I'll read the last one of the six that we have in the book. During the pandemic, I had days when I felt I was by myself on a shore drained of the tide, dragging a stick across miles of wet sand. There were also days when I was a boy again, sliding down a snowy hill on a flattened cardboard box. And there were days when I remembered the teacher who made us memorize a poem each week. And when we asked why, she said we might one day find ourselves in a wreck at the side of the road and we would recite these poems to stay alive. Wow, what a truly amazing collection. And I really love what you said about how the process connected you all together. And in this time when we so often feel are, are feeling disconnected, that the, it's so interesting to think about anthologies and how they not only connect authors to their audience, but authors to one another. So thank you for that. You know, Dennis Nerksy, who has a wonderful poem in the book too, said to me, it's a good time for poets. Uh, it's, it's because a lot of poets are, are, are very happy for what the English poet John Clare referred to as hermit joy. <laughs> be alone to be able to write their poems. Um, but not such a great time for people right. who are vulnerable. Um, yeah. and but definitely fodder for creative work. I can hear that. It looks like we do actually have a question. Helen would like to know, will there be a follow-up anthology? Well, I would think that somebody would follow up with a, another anthology um, because we're, in, we're we've, we've already endured kind of a very strong second phase um, with this national reckoning with so much uh, that is so necessary. And we're, we're moving into a new stretch. So it may be that there'll be a little light at the end of the tunnel. And this very strong, important political moment will, will yield and let us uh, out of the tunnel a little bit. That makes sense. Now, what do you, do you think you have an idea of what kind of, what would kind of be the substance of a follow-up anthology? Or do you think that we're not far enough removed from this moment to know what that tone would be? Well, I, I look at the poems that that we, we brought into this anthology from just June 6th to July 10th or 11th. And they were so, they were poems of such profound reckoning, um, you know, spiced with anger and um, laced with a, a very strong, bitterness, and then also um, shot through with, with hope of, of a political nature, too. Uh, and so I, I think that the poems reflect their time. And even that six-week period after we brought the first 87 together yielded another 21 or two and could have yielded 40 if I didn't have to cut it off in order to have a book today. Um, so I think each swatch of time, will have that coloration of the complexity and the force and the uh, emotional significance of their moment. Thank you for that. It reminds me of something that I read also in reference to the pandemic um, about Fried Zakaria's new book about how some moments in time are larger than others. And so interesting how six weeks at the begin towards the beginning of the pandemic can encompass so much experience uh, which it might not otherwise so thank you for that um well, you know, it's been a long period it's it's after 9 11 there were a slew of very significant poems that ran in the new yorker dj sashadri's the disappearances adam zagievsky's try to praise the mutilated world deborah garrison's poem about seeing a Wall Streeter with his shirt torn, covered in dust, called I Saw You Walking. I mean, W.S. Merwin's To the Words. Um, but that, and, and that was a very charged moment. That wasn't just one moment. That we lived inside that moment for quite a while. And of course, this has been even, even more prolonged and, and worldwide. Right. 
definitely. Thank you for that. Um, well, it looks like we have another couple questions in the chat. Um, this one is actually for Oblong. Will you be getting in more copies of the book? Yes, actually. Last time I checked earlier today, we still had about 15 copies left. They were all signed by Alice. And I actually ordered another carton today. So if you're interested, you can definitely order a copy or multiple copies at oblongbooks.com. Um, and let me see if this is another question here. That is not that. It's just a comment. Say, someone saying that we, they feel that we do need another anthology because of how much emotionally has happened in recent weeks. Um, Alice, I think maybe now is a good place to stop. It seems like there are a lot of questions, but I just want to thank you again. This has been such an enriching evening. And thank you for taking the time and coming online with us. And thank you again to all of our poets for sharing parts of yourselves and your work with us. Did you have anything else to say before we end? Well, thank you to Oblong so much. And I hope all the people who joined tonight will come on up to the Oblong and ride the rails to trails and see this part of the world. It's so beautiful. It thank is. It's so thank beautiful. you all very much. And thanks to Helen and Leif from Oblong. And there's lots of warm thanks in the question box now. So thank you all so much. And now is just a final moment to say to everyone that Right now is what would have been our holiday season at Oblong. So if you haven't already, start thinking about holiday shopping because lots of small businesses like ours are dependent on the holiday season for the rest of the year. So thank you all again for supporting us. And one more final note is that we will have another event with Bill Clegg and Laura Zygman this Thursday at 7 p.m. So I hope you can all join us. Thank Thanks. you, Alice. Bye. Bye, everyone.